Welcome to Roots of Faith. I'm Renee Richard, and today we are five miles, about five miles south of Baton Rouge, but we're on the West Bank to showcase the church parish that's here. And I'm standing on the Mississippi River, and of course, this year we're in flood stage, but this river is so important to the history of not only our diocese, but also to the history of Louisiana with the settlers that it brought and the traffic it brought and the livelihood that it provided for the people of this area. And as I look out here, we know that this church parish was founded where this river is now. We know the cemetery was moved inland. Um, bodies were reinterred from it. And this mighty Mississippi has taken it over. But again, without that history of the river, we would not know a lot of the history of these church parishes. The settlers that came, the original Acadians that landed here, were lucky enough to be some of the forebearers of this parish, and they're well documented. So one in particular, Jean-Baptiste Hebert, his, he was born in Maryland, came here, had land here, started this parish by providing a cemetery here, and we're at Bruley Landing, where today we'll be talking about the wonderful, rural, vibrant community of St. John the Baptist, and this church even has the descendants of some of those original people. So join us as we explore this wonderful parish. my guest today, Father Matt Lorraine, um, here at St. John in Brutley. Father Matt, uh, you've been here, you were telling me, about seven years? Correct. I, I arrived just about seven years ago and I'm very much enjoying my time here. So Good. I'm settled in now and hopefully to stay a few more years. That's great. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I was born in southwest Louisiana in Sulphur, and then we moved across the state to Homa, Oh, wow. And then finally to Metairie, and so I really said I grew up in Metairie, although we, we kind of traveled across the state. Uh, got to Baton Rouge by com coming up to LSU and was very involved in the Catholic Student Center at LSU at the time. Uh, had a great Catholic faith community, got involved in retreats and in ministry, and that's where the call to being a priest hit me when I was at Christ the King. Thought about studying for the Archdiocese of New Orleans, but ended up studying for the Diocese of Baton Rouge. Oh, I have, have family all across the state, so this ended up being a very good, good spot. That's great. And you've been a priest about how long? 33 years. Awesome. Very it good. goes by quickly. Uh, it does. <laughs> I remember when you were with me over yes. in St. John for many, many years. We were, we were parishioners for you then. Um, now you're here in this beautiful community, very old community, um, here in West Baton Rouge Parish. This place... They even on the same grounds, but this has been a community, a faith community since the early 1800s. Um, it originally started in around 18, um, 1885. It was decreed um, from the archdiocese to be the Catholic Church of West Baton Rouge. Of course, the official title is in French right. um, on the documents, and it was established as a mission of Baton Rouge. And so um, we know y'all have great old records that are in our archives um, showcasing some of the the history that allow us to know this, um, but the property that this church sits on has been church property that whole time. It's not one of these. It's been moved because of the river, correct? Correct. Absolutely. This is a very old community, and that's one of the things I enjoy about it. There's still a lot of families that go back to the very uh, earliest days of the parish, as right. well as some new families who have moved in. So we have a nice mixture of families who have been here for generations, as well as those who have moved into the parish. And so it gives us a sense of stability and history, but also a sense of uh, new life coming on board, entering into the community. So it's a, a very wonderful balance. Um, originally, priests from St. Joseph in Baton Rouge came out and said mass mm -hmm. for the Catholics living in this area before the church parish was established. They built a chapel, although they had mass in their homes and they built a right. chapel. And finally, in 1835, they officially became a parish, although not a resident priest. Right, initially. not until several years later. Right. Um, and our records do begin when the priests came here. Going back to what we were saying about the priests coming and they were saying Mass in the homes, we know that the home that they said Mass in was Jean Baptiste Hebert. He was born, he's actually, this goes back to the Acadian exile. His family was exiled. He was actually born in, in like 1760, 1761. I'm not going to give an exact date. Um, in Maryland as part of that group. Mm -hmm. And then comes here, very devout man. They first He first allowed him, I think, to establish a burial ground on his property and ended up um, being the one to buy land for this church. But 
we know that mass was said in his parlor. And it's amazing because when you drive down Main Street when I was coming here, I'm seeing the, the street names of people that I know from here, like Lejeune's, I know Lejeune's from here, Avia's from here. These are descendants of that, or those original Acadians that came in the 1700s. So the faith community was here and the trials they had through the, um, you know, with the exile, post-exile. But they are, they were the only church in West Baton Rouge for many years also. Correct. And that legacy continues and that there's a great deal of ownership in this church parish from the parishioners. Uh, they do so many things that I haven't experienced in other church parishes. They unlock the church in the morning, they lock it in the evening, they set up for mass, they run the cemetery uh, in terms of the sale of plots and burials and so forth. All that's done by volunteer parishioners who just give themselves to the church parish uh, because they, they're invested. You know, this is part of their, their family their background heritage. and their heritage yeah. and uh, rightly very proud of it and makes the life of the priest a lot easier when you have that much uh, volunteerism and, and that much uh, dedication to their church community. That's great. About how many um, families or people do you have here mm -hmm. in the parish? Right around 1,500 families. Okay, we that's... have four masses on the weekend, and all four of them have a, a great attendance. So. That's good. Yeah, because when I was doing the research for this, I didn't find any current data. I found some data from, you know, 15, 20 years ago mm -hmm. that had about the same number. So mm -hmm. this is, this is it's a sta very stable parish. I mean, that, we're all aware of that. But do you find it's growing? It is growing. people are it moving out this way from Baton Rouge? There are new neighborhoods uh, being developed, new houses being built. So very much so, it's, it's growing both with the children and grandchildren of parishioners, but also with new families moving in. What, um, what are your demographics here in terms of um, racial mix? Or do, you, is it, do we have a good blend or is it? Very good blend, predominantly a white community, but we do have some African-Americans, we have some Creoles, we have some uh, members of the Hispanic community have moved in also. So it's a very uh, diverse, friendly community, good. welcoming community. We, have a, um, we don't have a parochial school here, but we have parochial schools on either side of us. But we have very good uh, public schools here in Brulee that are well supported by the entire community. Father Matt, we were just talking about the public school being you know really good out here when we were walking in the back I noticed a little bell rang and a bunch of kids came out so you do have some type of program here one of your ministries we deals have. with preschoolers how we did have, that come about we have a new Mother's Day out program it started there I had one here historically uh, some years back and it had ended um, most of the families were sending their kids to the, the good early learning center at the school but then when the traffic uh, worsened uh, going traffic. across the bridge <laughs> and so forth uh, some young families came and asked if we could restart the Mother's Day out and I said sure if y'all take charge of it so they organized it and started it and it's three mornings a week uh, Tuesday Wednesday Thursday from about nine o'clock to one o'clock and seems very successful and it's nice to hear the, the the voices of the children in the morning on campus that's great and you again it's the same thing you were talking about with the ministries being run and just so well run by the parishioners here, correct? Absolutely. We have a, a beautiful campus. We have nice facilities. And so it's nice to see them being used. Uh, sometimes it can be a little hectic keeping things clean when we have so many activities going on, but it's also a sign of the vitality of the parish. Mm -hmm. All ages and all facets of the community take part in the ministry here. We, we, you would, that's the young ministry, and you were just telling me about the bereavement committee. <laughs> Let's go to the opposite end of our life here, but you were saying y'all have a really great bereavement committee. We're very proud of the bereavement committee. Uh, we have six teams of wow. volunteers, and so they each take two months out of the year, and any time there's a funeral of a parishioner, they prepare a full meal in the activity center for them so that the family doesn't have to try to uh, open their home necessarily for you know dozens of people. People have to come. They can we we can have the mass here in church. We have the burial in the cemetery right behind the church, and then we walk to the activity center, and they're able to visit and continue sharing memories of their loved ones and offering uh, consolation to the family. And it's it's just a nice part of saying goodbye to someone and also supporting parishioners at a time of loss. Mm -hmm. And you do have an active cemetery here. Um, we saw it, you know, behind the church here. This parish, over time, the Mississippi River has eaten away the original property. The church has been moved back or rebuilt. In this case, too, the original church, they had a brick church that was built like in the 1840s when y'all became a parish. And then in 1907, y'all had a fire. 
Um, and oftentimes people call the archives asking about records and they always say, oh, well, there was a fire that destroyed those records. There's only two parishes the old records were destroyed in. This was one of them. We lost roughly um, up to 1907 when the fire occurred um, from the 1890s to 1907. That was all for baptisms only. So it's not major. Like in Paulina, they lost everything mm -hmm. before 1920. So it's just a small percentage of records, but it did indicate the fire. And then the church was built then. Then the river came in and moved it they had to move it. Um, I think they all stayed in the original church, though, right? Until right. This church this. was just about on this site. Uh, when they were renovating the church, they discovered the foundation of the previous church that had been lost in the fire. So it's still very close, although shifted back somewhat. And um, we lost also the rectory burn at one time. We lost some of the rectors mm -hmm. from the rectory records from the rectory fire in addition to the church fire. Okay. But each time, people rebuild. And so. Right. And the cemetery, we were originally talking about the cemetery, to get back on that point. Um, the cemetery that's here had to have been, been moved from the original property. It was further south and where the river is now. And some of the graves were reinterred in the cemetery that's existing, um, and, which is very big. If you look at old pictures, the cemetery was a good distance behind the church, and now it's closer because it's you know right. it's being used more but the original founder the one that was born in Maryland Jean-Baptiste Hebert we know that he was reinterred um and there because he was such an instrumental I think the church was actually they think the church was named you know after him as John the Baptist but there are quite a few um tombs if you want to visit here and look for them um founding families like the Gassies as well as some of the priests that have served here are buried correct, correct. and there's the a mixture of English and French on the tombstones, the old tombs, you can see that. It's very interesting. And we have occasionally some students from LSU will come out and walk through the cemetery and look at the old uh, graves and re record some of the inscriptions on them just mm -hmm. for historical purposes. purposes. But we're fortunate, we're blessed to have enough land that our we start at the river and go all the way back to Highway 1. So we're oh, wow. able to keep expanding as needed so that uh, we continue to serve the needs of the community. That's great. And if you do visit here, um, to, to visit the cemetery, because plenty of people do that, or view of ancestors here. The crosses, they were telling me, the, the wrought iron ones were um, handmade blacksmith um, forged, and those are the tombs of those who were reinterred, correct? Some Just of those, and I think some of those may have continued after the cemetery was here. Okay. Uh, there was a local blacksmith parishioner, and he, and he made a lot of those iron crosses, and uh, we still have a parishioner today who refurbishes them when they become in, in uh, poor shape. Oh, what a blessing. Yeah, yeah. so it, it, the cemetery is, is loved. It's cared for. That's uh, there's great. always people praying and visiting, and, um, and we appreciate that. Yeah, so many of our cemeteries um, that are along the river had the metal stolen, well, taken from them during the, the wars with boats mm -hmm. coming down the river, and they needed the metal. And we know that they were, you know, desecrated in that sense. They took it for war cause. So we're blessed that that did not occur here. We were just talking on break about different features about this parish, and Father was telling me um, that you actually did a funeral for someone who, as a, as a young boy, helped to do the grotto that's in front of the church. Tell us a little bit about that grotto. The pastor at the time, Father Victor Baron, was a Frenchman and he had a devotion to our Blessed Mother, Our Lady of Lords, and so he gathered five teenagers from the parish and in 1954 they built the grotto in front of church with the statue of Our Blessed Mother in it and they were telling me that it took them quite a while to do it and I asked them, well, who supervised you know, uh, your work? They said, Father Baron supervises himself. And so it, it's a source of pride for the community that they've always been involved and in. we still have, a, of course, a great devotion to our Blessed Mother. And it just goes to show, too, that they're still here. They're these, still here, These, these Absolutely. people who built it, you know, 50, 60 65 now, 60, years 65 ago. years, yeah. they're still living in this community, which says Absolutely. so much. The church we're in right now was completely redone, it finished, was it finished in 2011? When, April the 10th, it was rededicated in 2011. And y'all started it like in 2009 or so. Um, but this is the, the 1907 church, which I think was completed around, around 1913, somewhere in there. I'm not going to be specific, after the fire. And y'all took it down to a shell, pretty much, correct? And kind of expanded. Tell us a little bit about what took place with the, the, the great job that's been done here. It was always a nice church, but over the years, especially after the Second Vatican Council, they had done mm -hmm. some remodeling inside, and according to the um, sentiment at the time, 
Looking back on it now, they probably removed too much. Also, the, the uh, steeple had been blown off in a hurricane several way times. back. Yeah, since so it was missing. There was an external bell tower that they had built out of pipe in front of the church to hang, hang the bells in. So when Father Matt Dupre was here, my predecessor, there was a movement. They needed more room. The church was a little bit small, and it needed to be restored. Um, and so they had undertook a great campaign, and the walls were covered with acoustical tile. There was carpet on the floors, and they decided, let's peel all that off and get back to something that would have been original. And at the same time, let's expand the church a little bit toward the river. We were able to add some room to recreate the choir loft. They reattached the bell tower on the church, and then they built an annex with the restrooms and a vesting sacristy and a bride's room just to make the church more functional today. Mm -hmm. And we really ended up with something magnificent, beautiful, uh, better than... It still than looks just like it did pretty much in 1907. Yes. I mean, when I was researching this, I was amazed at the extent to which they, they went here. They had scaffolding. You can't really see how far down we are, kind of from the altar, but scaffolding, these beaded boards were completely replaced because there was lead and asbestos right. that they had to get out of here. The pews were removed and completely redone. These are the original pews they brought are. back. Stations of the Cross were, were refurbished. Um, and then there's five stained glass windows that surround in the asp. Is that the correct term mm -hmm. for that? Um, Though they, the exact same size of the ones that were there, but these are completely designed and totally new, correct? correct. And they, the, the theme behind them is amazing. So the, the first one, to, if you're facing the altar, to the left of the altar is the Word of God. The Word of God. Um, and I don't know all the different symbolism in it, but um, it's, it, you, you know it based on that word when you uh -huh. see it. This, and then the three that you see from the body of the church, although the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, they're beautiful. The Son is the one that's directly behind the altar, and that yellow glass is just amazing. You really can't see necessarily all that's in it from different aspects of the church. And then the one that's, um, the one that's on the far right, by far, is my favorite, um, and it depicts the actual church, this church in the image. But it's the Holy Spirit coming down on the church through the waters of the Mississippi River with the muscles that I guess were food substance, I know for the, the Native Americans, right. um, and probably many generations following that on either side of the Holy Spirit. And it just, the, the blues and the greens just flood this beautiful church. And it's an amazing picture. So they did a great job because these are totally new windows, right? Right. These windows were designed by Steve Wilson, the stained glass artist in Baton Rouge, and he really did a wonderful job. He knew the, the center window of representing the sun, the, the second person of the Trinity would be hidden by the altar somewhat. So he, he made it kind of the radiance of Christ. Uh, the Father's all kind of symbolism with uh, a hand reaching down. Um, there's a rainbow also mm -hmm. in that w window. Um, there's a- The blood. The blood, Red the stars blood. and the moon. Uh, the Holy Spirit, you can see doves ascending and descending in the, in the Holy oh, Spirit. So it's, they're beautiful uh, windows. There were probably stained, some stained glass in the side windows in the nave at one time because they found pieces of glass after the fire, and so they went back with kind of a, uh, not a stained glass, but it's not totally clear either, mm -hmm. um, kind of a muted, which allows natural light to come in, which is very beautiful also. It is, and what they did is they kept the images from the old stained glass windows, and they have smaller versions, correct? We but they're, they're replicas of them. So in in that, what do you call the passageway? Just that goes, the, the corridor connecting the, corridor the that connects annex, the, the walkway. The annex. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're hanging in the windows on either side. And so that way you can really see what was here, which was beautiful as well, um, depicted in a different way. Mm -hmm. So um, that's some of the things that were done when they when they redid this, this beautiful church. And of course it had to have all new electrical, all new oh, yeah. lighting, air conditioning, uh, water, everything had to be redone once they started taking it apart. You have to do what's necessary, but we have something that's going to last many decades more now. On break just now, we were talking about another ministry that is, um, I think, really important that we mention, and that is y'all run a thrift shop here, correct? Right. Some of our parishioners, they receive donations of household items, clothing, and every Thursday morning they open up, and it's like a little thrift shop, garage sale, and 
people from all over the community come and visit it, and uh, all those proceeds go to help the church. And they made quite a substantial donation to the building fund just recently of several years worth of income. But it gives them something to do. It provides a service for the community in terms of having uh, good quality clothing and items that some families could use, and so we're re very proud of their work also. That's awesome because, you know, one man's junk is another man's treasure, and I know my kids growing up, and to this day, my son who lives in, in Newark, uh, you know, Stephen, mm -hmm. well, he only shops at thrift stores because he, sure. he feels like it's, it's important. I think that's more and more, we're seeing that more and more in the younger generations. The other thing that um, we were talking about on break that I, I want to come back to, too, is the bells here. Right. Because um, you mentioned earlier that the steeple had fallen. When, when I was researching, I think the steeple has come off this church several times in various storms. Um, right after it went up, I think it, the church, right after it went up, within a year, I think a hurricane brought them down. And then um, I think it, they've been down since like the 1930s, Right. not on the ground. And at one point, they, you said they were, they were like an iron, they were here mm -hmm. in the back. Um, and that somebody would come and actually... Right, the, the bells were manual for many years where they had a rope you would pull, and they have a tradition here of ringing the bells for the angelus, and we still do that. It's very nice to hear the bells ringing in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. And one of the parishioners was a local barber, and he, he volunteered to ring the bells for the angelus for the pastor, and Father Carvo mentioned to me that he was having his hair cut one day right around noon, and the barber said, will you excuse me just a, just a moment, ran over to church, rang the bells, and ran back. <laughs> so <laughs> to, it must have been close by. They were close by. I mean, it's he a was small town. The next it, block over. It must Correct. be fairly close by, and you would probably hear them all over town, which is great. Right. And I do know in researching that, you know, bells, the bells were used for a lot of reasons. There were three bells. Um, we know that one of them is named Maria. Um, the, the blessing of the bells is in our archives. It's recorded in one of our books. Mm -hmm. It is in French. Um, it was in 1888 that they blessed the, um, the three bells. I think they, were, they might have been milled in New York. Um, I'm not 100% certain on that. But the, they, they're assuming that the biggest one would be Marie. They also had sponsors. And this is not an uncommon tradition right. in the Catholic Church is that a bell is baptized. It's given a name. It's blessed. And then prominent people in the community, either by donation, plain times it's who donated the land or a family member of that, uh, they'll be the godparents for the bells. And so they, these three bells had at least six godparents between them when I was reading through all the different names, same names, you know, Acadian names that we see, I don't remember That's them right. That's um, right. offhand. But, you, you know, they did ring them, and so now there was a campaign done when they did this church to lift the bells up and to replace that long lost steeple that had not been done. Right. Um, and one of the things that I thought was fascinating and fabulous history is that the parishioners were allowed to come out and sign the inside of, I guess, the structure, the bell, bell fry, belfry right. that was sitting on the ground and we can put a picture up there to show it. And they, they picked a Saturday or something and you could come out and sign that. I mean, how wonderful is that? I know y'all put a time capsule in also, right? I think we did, yes. Somewhere, and it's in a courtyard on the ground. I have a picture of it also. But the bell is as much part of a time capsule for people. It may right. never come down again, but I thought that was a, a, a fabulous tradition to do. In Catholic worship, we like to use all of our senses. You know, our sight, our hearing, our smell, the, of the incense, the sound of bells, of course, the music, um, the stained glass windows, the colors, the vestments for the different seasons that we really involve with the entire person in terms of thanking God for his blessings and asking God for his intercession in our lives. And we can encounter God in so many ways by using our different senses. And the bells are just one of those facets. That's true. I think I also read at one point, though, y'all had electronic bells when the bells were not being used also. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that correct? But the parishioners wanted the bells brought sure. back. So again, the involvement of this, this great parish um, in, in the role of the Catholicism that's been here for so long. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the bells and, and the history with the bells and one of the other things too with, with bells is that 
the bells would ring for other things besides necessarily the Angelus. Back in the day, if there was a fire, the bells rang. If there was an accident on the Mississippi River right here, the bells would ring for people to come help. And if there was a case of a death or a burial, they, they would have been buried here. Sure. So, you know, this parish, having been here for so long, has such a rich history of not just Catholicism too, but, you know, of river traffic, of life on a, a river like this. And for instance, we were talking about how this land has been eaten up by the Mississippi River. Also, there was a mission of um, St. John the Baptist Parish, and it was called St. Francis of Assisi Chapel, and it was at Sordine Point, which I believe is south of here. Um, and at the, in 1932, the chapel there was moved here. It, was, it began around 1888 as a mission, but it was actually moved here, and it's now y'all's parish office, right, it's the served, original building. It served as the parish hall for many years until we built the new activity center, and now it's used as our parish office, but it's been a place of worship and a place of gathering, you know, since its inception. And so it's nice to have it here on our church property when yeah. it was no longer needed. And such a, a part of your integral history. And you made a very good point when we were on break about the, this church and the relationship to the river. There's so always we'll a sense close on a question on of how did the church get its name? And we mentioned that the, the one, original uh, parishioner, Jean-Baptiste Hebert, maybe Could've it was been. named after Jean-Baptiste, but... With John the Baptist being, he was baptizing in the Jordan River, it's nice that we're on the river road right here on the banks of the mighty Mississippi River. And it's a perfect setting for a church parish dedicated to John the Baptist because baptisms, that's the way we enter into the life of the church and the body of Christ. And uh, it's a wonderful connection that we maintain with our patron saint. I can't get any better than that. <laughs> so, Father Matt, thank you so much for being my guest today and for showcasing this wonderful historic um, parish that we have in our diocese. Thank you very much. Folks, join us again for another episode of Roots of Faith.